Welcome to the Back on Track podcast with me, Sam West. In every episode, I interview someone who's changed, recovered, or become successful after having faced real adversity in their life. What's more, at the end of every episode, guests give you a few bits of advice which you can use to improve your own life too. On today's episode is the brilliant sports journalist and author, Ian Ridley. In February of 2019, Ian's wife, Vicky Orvis, who was also a brilliant and renowned journalist, sadly died of cancer at the age of just 56. After experiencing the unbearable feelings that grief can bring with it, Ian decided to write a book called The Breath of Sadness on Love, Grief and Cricket, which explains his own grieving process and how the varying emotions changed over time. For Ian, it was watching a summer of county cricket that helped him through his darkest moments, and he encourages others that are suffering after the loss of a loved one to find their own activity, which might be able to provide some respite from the sadness. Above all, I really admire Ian's bravery in coming on the podcast to talk about all of this in the hope that it might be able to help others. So, without further ado, let's find out what happened by listening to his story from start to finish. Ian, first of all, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, how are you doing? How's everything going? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm uh, buoyed by a very enjoyable lunch with some friends of Vicky's and some friends of mine. So, uh, yeah. It's 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 okay, and thank you for asking me, Sam. Lovely, fantastic, yeah. And um, Ian, I, I mentioned to you that before doing the podcast, I wanted to to read your fantastic book, uh, which is called "The Breath of Sadness on on Love, Grief, and and Cricket," um, which details sort of your journey of grieving after the the tragic passing of of your wife Vicky. Um, now it's both a brilliant and incredibly moving read, and and one that actually reduced me to to tears on on a number of occasions and I'm sure um, a lot of other people as well um, and we'll put a link in the description so everyone can can find find where to buy it I really recommend they do but one thing that I perhaps also wasn't expecting about it Ian is I, I found it to be incredibly educational it taught me so much about what to expect if I ever you know find myself in 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 that situation and there were some things that I hadn't heard about before sort of the anxiety the obsession and sort of the various different stages so I really benefited from it um, as a reader in in that way, not just enjoying the story. and And I'm wondering why. Um, I'm wondering if that was intentional to sort of give it that educational side, um, as well as obviously just telling an incredibly dear story to to you. Well, thank you for your kind comments about the book, Sam. I guess in a way it was. Um, I didn't want to preach to anyone or tell anybody how to handle grief because. Uh, Everybody's very, very different. You know, you, they talk about five stages of grief and, and you know, anger and depression and denial and, uh, you know, you get finally to acceptance. Um, you know, bargaining uh, is apparently one. But th- they're just not linear. They go in all different directions and you go in and out of each stage and everybody's different as to what affects them. W- what affected me most you know, was um, how kind of obsessional I became. Um, As I always said, um, I expected sadness, but I didn't expect madness. And and that was kind of, that really took me by surprise. And it's it's interesting what you say. I mean, I had no, I I wanted everyone to know what a wonderful woman Vicky was for a start. Uh, And I wanted um, her kind of legacy to live on. And I wanted to tell an honest story of what it was like so that was my second aim. I guess my third aim was that if there was something in there that might help other people in some way, then I'd be very, very happy. I mean, the only thing I, I felt able to pass on to people as a as an actual advice was, you know, whatever, for me, going to cricket that summer was a, a form of both distraction and, and a soothing activity. Uh and I would just urge people to find whatever activity it is for them, really, whatever, you know, interests them, whatever is a diversion from them. Because you can't spend all day, every day in in the pain because your body can't take it, your mind can't take it. So you do need to find something that will give you some pain relief without, you know, literally throwing pills or alcohol down your neck. 
Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I love that sort of um, one of the parting comments in the book where you say, you know, I um, sort of urge people to find their cricket. Obviously, it was cricket for you and it can be something else for other people. And um, yeah, Ian, in this podcast, I sort of plan to follow events as they are in the book because um, largely they are chronological. And that's sort of the way that I, pro- I approach interviews on this podcast because I find it's... Um, it's nice for listeners to to understand a guest story in in that way, but but before we do get into sort of um, events as they as they are told in the book, Ian, I wondered if you could tell us the listeners um, about uh, the incredible person that that Vicky was, both professionally uh, and personally, and and all she achieved. Because obviously, I learned a great deal <clears throat> through reading the book, but it's obviously much more fitting if um, yeah, if you could if you could tell us about that first of all. Well. Um... Vicky was the first uh, woman uh, football writer on a, the staff of a tabloid newspaper when she joined The Sun in 1995. She'd grown up in Sheffield. Her father, she was an only child, and her father take, took her to see Sheffield United um, very early, and she formed a great love for, for football and, and Sheffield United. Her favourite player was Tony Curry. Um, then she saw the World Cup at the age of 12 in 1974 and fell in love with Johan Cruyff. And uh, be- he became a lifelong crush for her. Um, <laughs> so after that, she, she was very clever at school um, in Sheffield. She went to Leicester University, got a degree in English, decided she wanted to be a journalist. Uh, she got She did a postgraduate course and then her first job was on the Wakefield Express in Yorkshire. Then she went to Bristol Evening Post and then she got shifts on, uh, sorry, the Western Daily Press in Bristol. And then she got um, shifts on the Observer and the Daily Mail in London um, in her late 20s. And then she uh, got a staff job on the Mail as consumer affairs correspondent, but she always wanted to write about football. She, she didn't um, get the chance. She They gave her Saturday matches, but... The old sports editor at the time said he didn't think a woman could be a full-time football reporter. So she got approached by the Sun after um, sports editor there, funnily enough, with the same name as me, Paul Ridley, um, had um, spotted her her work in the the Mail, offered her a job. And in 2000, she also became um, the athletics correspondent of the the Sun. And she spent 20 years then... um, covering five Olympic Games, all the World Championships, all the European Championships in between. And that kind of took over from her football, although football was always her first passion. Athletics became a real um, thing in her, in her life. And she had so many strings to her bow, though. I mean, she she was diagnosed with cancer in 2007. Um, she spent six years as a patient governor at the Royal Marsden Hospital, where she was treated she was a founder member of Women in Football. You know, so many things she, she did and, and achieved. She was going to be the first uh, female chair of the Football Rights Association. Um, she was vice chair, and but she died before that could come to fruition. I mean, she was an amazingly rounded woman. And one thing I want to say, actually, is, you know, there is this sort of stereotype of, of Sun reporters. You know, Vicky was not in that mould at all. She was very, very bright. She loved, yeah, she loved the National Theatre. She loved opera. She was a great reader. She established a book festival in our village and booked some amazing names for it, a tiny little village, and we got all sorts of major authors due to her. So, you know, she was a very rounded um, human being. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she achieved so much. And I, I think I remember reading the book, actually, there was one um, one athlete that remarked that when talking to Vicky, he always gave away sort of more than he felt he should have because she was such a such a good interviewer. And I just felt that sort of really spoke volumes of her of her journalistic uh, ability. That, um, uh, that was Greg Rutherford, I think, the long jumper. It's- yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But that. Yeah. That really summed up to me just sort of how how good Vicky was, and obviously she achieved um, a lot more outside journalism uh, uh, as well. So um, yeah, thank you for for taking the time to to, to describe Vicky for us, Ian. That was um, that was beautiful. But um, 
Vicky's cancer took a, a tragic turn in, in 2018, but you'd both actually been been living with cancer for some time before that. I think that's right. You mentioned Vicky's um, began in 2007 and and also your own secondary cancer had been <clears throat> had been going on for for some time before as well. And uh, I'm just wondering sort of how present it was on on both of your minds before Vicky's obviously became incredibly serious. Yes. Um well, she was diagnosed first in 2007, and I was diagnosed in 2009 with prostate cancer. Um, Vicky always used to joke that mine was just a little bit of man cancer. Um, <laughs> she had um, she had a secondary. It, they didn't know whether it was breast or ovarian. And in the book, I tell a story um, about how we were once at a football dinner with Sir Bobby Robson was sat on the table with us. And he'd been had a lot of cancer treatment at that time. And I just said to Bobby, um, Vicky's had cancer as well, Bob. And uh, and he turned to her and said, um, what kind? And uh, she said, well, it was either ovarian or breast. They couldn't find the primary at first. And he said, well, them pet are the only two I've not had. Yeah, I remember reading that yeah. in the book, actually. Yeah. yeah. So um, hers was Im- immediately very serious and she was you know, given chemotherapy very quickly. And but she went into remission on and off for the next 10, well, next 12 years in, in total. But she would occasionally the drugs would stop working or the chemo. She would need new chemo. Um, I had radiotherapy in 2009. Mine came back in 2012, um, and they've kept me alive with a combination of drugs and hormone therapy and so on. Um, But as you say, in 2018, um, she started, for the first time, she wasn't responding to treatment. They gave her three different chemotherapies that, that year, and they just weren't working. Uh, and it got to the point in the November where we went into the Royal Marsden one day. They were going to give us some blood tests to see, and a blood transfusion actually, to see if she could tolerate a new round of chemotherapy. And the results were so bad. And at five o'clock in the afternoon, I remember the oncologist coming to us and saying, you know, Vicky, I'm afraid, um, you know, we've run out of treatments for you. They're just not working. And we're now into the realms of palliative care. Um, Now, Vicky had never wanted to know what her prognosis was. She was always a person, you know, I'm just going to get on with it. I'm going to go on holidays. And she was such an intrepid person. She, her holidays took her to, she was a long haul girl. I didn't like um, long haul flights and everything. We we went to Italy every year and and had other holidays. But once a year, she liked to go on an organised trip to somewhere like Bhutan or South America and and Myanmar. She was very adventurous. And um, anyway, uh, we, we we were told that day, um, you know, she'd run out of treatments and and there was. She'd never wanted to, to know. She Off she went all around the world, all through her cancer, um, as well as with her job uh, privately. But um, I, at that, that time, that day, she had to go to the pharmacy to pick up some other painkillers or whatever. And I just went back to the oncologist and I said, look, Vicky doesn't like knowing these things, but what are we looking at now? And the oncologist said, well, probably... Um, less than a year and I said what does that mean does that mean 11 months and she said less I said six and she said if she's fortunate it's six wow so kind of that stopped me in my tracks really um I never told Vicky this and Vicky never knew that I went to see the oncologist privately um in the end we had three we had three months and she died on February the 6th, 2019. Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly moving part of the book after you find out. And obviously, then you had a few months of, of effectively being Vicky's primary primary carer. And I'm just I'm just wondering sort of how 
how tough that was for you because obviously you're trying to be so strong and a rock for for someone that needs it but obviously you're also going through you know uh, an extremely difficult period yourself so how difficult is it to sort of be that rock for someone when when you're hurting so deeply as well yeah I mean I tried very much to put my feelings on hold and, and to one side um do you know, I haven't spoken about this, Sam, for a while now, about that period, that three-month period. We can but, skip it, Ian, if, if, no, if you no, prefer. No, no, I'd, I'd mm. like to talk about it, actually. I, I mean, I, I think the thing with people who grieve is that they do actually want to talk about these things, in my experience. And and often it's the people around them that, that are, uh, find it a bit delicate to broach the subject. So I I felt incredibly privileged to be the person in her life that was kind of going to be there 24 seven for her, no matter what. And I'd made a commitment. I remember always remember in 2007 when they found the cancer weirdly in some fluid around her lungs uh, and they found cancer cells. And I went to the hospital as soon as she'd called me, I dashed over there in a fit of panic and I, and she said, listen, this is not going to get better. It's a secondary. It's going to get worse. And it could go on for some while, And it, but it will deteriorate. If you want to avoid that, I suggest you leave now. Wow. I'm, give, I'm giving you an out. Mm. And I said, Vicky, I, you know, I'm not going to do that. Of course I'm not going to do that. Um, we had our ups and downs, Sam. Don't get me wrong. You know, Vicky and I were a an incredibly passionate match, a volatile match in many ways, and we could drive each other nuts. And, you know, there would be times when we would need times apart. For example, if, I, if I'm honest, I quite look forward to her going away to cover athletics for a few days or a week or whatever, or, you know, I could have the house to my own and recharge. And, and I'm sure she felt the same, you know, in, in my job as a football writer, if I went away, anywhere um i expect she liked you know that that kind of respite herself from from me so um but i said to her no i'm not going to do that i've made a commitment and i will make a commitment and, and when those last three months that was my commitment to her um and i did i genuinely did feel privileged to be the one that was there for vicky the last three weeks four weeks were just very very difficult almost intolerably difficult um physically she deteriorated in in ways that were painful to behold uh, uh, you know as the cancer spread and and the things happened to her body um and she she sort of you know, she found it hard to be mobile and that got worse and worse and worse. And I think the problem was really, I was just trying to do it on my own. And about two weeks before she died, I just had to ring the hospital and say, I can't cope, you know, I need some help. And they sent Macmillan nurses round and, and palliative care nurses. And, and kind of, it was, that was such a relief for me. I was trying to feed her. I was trying to kept keep her hydrated we were in and out of hospitals in and out of a and e units um she had 23 days in hospital at one point in the uh late that year another 14 days in january in hospital in london i was driving in and out of london from hertfordshire every day um and so i was exhausted as well and I, I finally had to ask for help. Um, and that was about two weeks before she died. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's definitely nothing wrong with, with asking for help in that, in that situation. Uh, I know, wish it's... I'd asked earlier, to be honest. It was, um, I wasn't doing her any favours either. She needed more specialist care than I could give her. 
Yeah, but I can certainly imagine, you know, it's something that you want to take on yourself. And as you say, you know, it felt like a massive privilege. And that's something that I found really interesting reading the book, actually. And it's funny, I can actually remember where I was when I was reading this this part of the book. I went out fishing by myself for a day. And that's when I, I felt quite teary reading that reading that part. So it was it was conveyed uh, very, very powerfully. And, and Ian, you touched on something there as well, which I, I actually loved about the book, um, being in being in my own relationship, you know, and that's um, that, you you know, you didn't paint yours and Vicky's relationship in in the perfect uh, light, in the sense that, as you said, you spoke about the problems that you had, and and yeah, as a reader, I think I think I appreciated that in some way because obviously, you know, we all have our own relationships and they're similar in some ways. We all have our own difficulties, so that was something that that I I loved about the book actually. But Ian, the the next thing that I found really interesting was. After Vicky passed away, um, you mentioned something in the book, and I believe you referred to it as as the double edged sword of grief. And now, I think what you meant by that was, obviously, on the one hand, you're distraught that it's finally happened, but also on the other hand, you know that finally the, the pain is over um, for for Vicky. And I just thought that's quite an interesting sort of two feelings to be balanced side by side. And I wondered if you could explain a bit about that. Well. There is a lot of guilt that comes with grief quite early on in the grieving process. And one of them is that um, I was relieved for her uh, that she was no longer suffering, that um, this active woman, active of mind and body, was confined to a deathbed and um, her power of speech was going towards the end. So I was relieved for her in that sense. And I have to be honest, I was relieved for me. I was relieved that that um, that I wouldn't have to go through this with her anymore. I wouldn't have to watch her. Uh, and I wouldn't have to... Um, my life was no longer governed by um, this, this poignant, painful figure in front of me. Uh, and, you know, a, a figure I couldn't even get up the stairs to bed anymore, and had, we had to install a bed downstairs. So there was a guilt to that. There was a guilt to my relief at my own, um, my you know, that, that it was over for me too. I mean, it, it didn't last long. That was the double-edged so, sort of grief that you you, you mentioned, you know, and that uh, it's happened all the way through uh, the last couple of years, really, where, you think, um, you know, I, how to put it, really? It's you have these amazing warm memories on your good days of, of the times you had together. But at the same time, there's this realisation those times are gone now. And you're never going to get them back. So there's that paradox there as well, that, that um, edge to it as well. So... All this thing, it was a complete maelstrom after she died. Within about a week of, of her dying um, and any relief I felt, I, I kind of would have done anything to have had her back, even in that state. You know, absolutely, yeah, I can imagine. And Ian, another thing that there are various moments in the book where you're almost sort of taken aback by the the public reaction and and the support and and people coming out and saying how much you know they respected and and cared for Vicky. And there, there are two moments that kind of stick out at this this moment of of the book. And the first is when you did that that tweet, which um which went sort of semi viral or viral. I, I can't remember which received so much sort of um love and and sharing. All the rest of it, and and the second is, you know, Vicky's funeral was, um, you know, was a grand affair in the sense that there were five hundred people, you know, that that went to it. So it shows sort of just how many how many people's lives she touched. And and I'm just wondering if in those early stages, Ian, if those sort of, you know, well wishes and and support and seeing how many people's lives she touched, does does that help you or provide some comfort in those early stages, or or is there no no sort of um, nothing that that will help? in in any way really up until the funeral i was okay really in the sense that i i knew i had to hold it to told it together and i knew i wanted to give her a good send-off and i live in a small village in hertfordshire we lived in a small village and people rallied round and you know 
Vicky left instructions for her own funeral. I mean, I remember was, reading them. Yeah. She was amazing in that sense. What hymn she wanted? She wanted a gospel choir. She wanted me to do the, you know, it was a page and a half of A4. It, it was written so sort of bluntly as well, wasn't it? Yeah, I loved reading. It was, it, it was yeah. instructions. It, it wasn't was. kind of negotiations or anything. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, and bless her. Uh, so I had people helping me to deliver all that, although I wanted to make sure I got the right gospel choir and all that stuff. And um, I wanted it to be, uh, we suddenly got people contacting us, you know, um, saying they were coming. And and I realized we just weren't going to get everybody in the church. And I realized we needed a, a marquee outside and we needed, um, you know, TV screens to relay it outside and microphones and all that stuff. And the catering was taking on. I mean, she'd left instructions for me to go and get sandwiches from Marks and Spencer's and, yeah. and wine from Aldi. Yeah, and she very put specific. In brackets, one glass per person. <laughs> I mean, she conformed a bit to a Yorkshire stereotype there. It does. It does. Uh, but um, so I. Uh, I kind of um, was all right that to, then, really, but I was determined to make it a, a, a memorable, memorable affair. But somebody once said of Vicky, once met, never forgotten, and yes. I wanted the funeral to reflect that. Mm. Uh, and it did, and I've forgotten your question, Sam. No, yeah, it's, it's it's normal talking about talking about these things, but um, yeah, I was just asking in whether sort of the the well wishes and and oh, the yes. support of so I many mean, people. They were. We, we had. Hmm. We had um, amazing people came, you know, Jess Ennis Hill, Paula Radcliffe came to the, the funeral. Um, we had gold medalists, world record holders, people from sport, people from the media, all all sorts of people came. Sebastian Coe sent a message, um, a eulogy, which which read out um, by Jackie Oatley. So there were, it was all very emotional. And it was, I was in a bit of a, um days in many ways leading up to it so it was kind of uh yes of course it was comforting it was wonderful it was completely unexpected you know her obituary was in the times um she was on the last word on radio 4 the telegraph carried her obituary it was all astonishing the papers all did i didn't realize it was probably because she was only 56 as well and it shocked everybody it was somebody, one of her good friends said to me, well, we knew she had cancer and we knew it was serious, but she was Vicky. She seemed indestructible. She just kept going. And people were shocked that it finally got her. So it was all comforting. But the other thing, Sam, that I didn't realise until afterwards, at some time afterwards, was I didn't realise I was going to share Vicky with everyone. Vicky was my wife. We were just two job in journalists that getting on with our lives really and and all of a sudden she's a little bit of a public figure and got a profile and that kind of thing and I thought I don't want to share her with other people really but and I didn't I didn't have any concept of other people's grief I was so wrapped up in my own and I that you know that other people couldn't possibly be as upset as as I was so you know therefore um, you know, my feelings were paramount. If I'm honest, I was kind of a bit selfish about that. But um, it was a comfort, yeah, is the answer to your question. It, it was amazing to think that Vicky was going to be um, recognised and remembered like this. Absolutely. Now, I found it incredible reading the book, the amount of the amount of things and seeing how many people's lives she touched. Um, yeah, I found that incredible. And it's it's interesting to know that, yeah, it provided some comfort, but obviously, um, you know, a, a limited amount, of course, because, you know, even with all of the well wishes and, and support in the world, it's still an incredibly difficult time. And and another thing that I loved uh, again about the book, it was and again, the, the sort of honesty of it. And that was, you know, shortly after Vicky's death, you you detailed how how you considered sort of stopping your stopping taking your own cancer drugs to stop the spread of of the cancer effectively you know um wanting to to not carry on with life and and that just shows people the extent to of of the grief that you were feeling and i'm just wondering yeah if you could tell us a bit about that and and why in the end you decided not not to take that course of action 
there were several reasons why I was in so much pain and I, I couldn't ever see getting out of the pain. It was just a very, very dark place all day, every day through the night. I wasn't sleeping. Um, I'd sit on the landing some nights at two in the morning and I'd shout and beg her to reappear. Hoping we live in a 400 year old house, an old cottage. And, you know, I just, I just sort of thought there would be so much history in this house that maybe maybe some spectre would appear or whatever. And, of course, that never happened. But um, it was after the funeral, really, once I'd held myself together for so long. And immediately I think I got ill with, with a kind of a heavy cold and I took to my bed for a day or two. And my daughter had, was working in Singapore and she'd come over to help me and, and support me. And uh, she had to go back um, to her fiancé and her job. And it was then suddenly how brutal it was. The house was empty. Uh, people were lovely around the village. They'd leave sort of Tupperwares of spaghetti bolognese on my doorstep and that kind of thing. Um, and they'd invite me out for coffee and all that. Uh, but actually, I was very much aware I was now alone. Um, and I... Vicky was a a kind of insipid sort of Christian in many ways. She she sort of struggled to believe in the afterlife until but she she loved our church and she loved like Sunday morning services and what have you but she I would never describe her as a committed Christian but she she had this sort of belief and she went to see our old vicar who'd retired. She asked me to take him me her to see him shortly before she died. And she said, I'm struggling with the afterlife, John. And, and he said, well, none of us has any definitive answers, Vicky, but I would, um, what I would say is, it, it, why don't you treat it like another adventure, like another country to be visited? And Vicky came out of there and she said to me, I can deal with that, actually. That makes sense to me. I, that, that suited her psyche. So I, I am a Christian as well. And... Um, I've always had a belief in a higher power. Uh, I found one being a recovering alcoholic of 33 years sobriety. There were just so many good things that happened in my life after getting sober that, that there must have been some kind of higher power at work. So I did kind of have this in my sadness, in my grief, in my anger. I had this feeling that, well, if I... If I was going to die, then it meant, would mean I'd be with Vicky again quicker. You know, I, I would I would get to see her again. So there's no point stringing this out now. My life is over. Um, Vicky's gone. I've had a good life. I've done everything I wanted to do in my life. Um, you know, I worked in newspapers, which uh, in their heyday, I covered World Cups and everything. And. I've written 13, 14 books and and I've been I've done what I wanted to do with my life. And I had two great kids and what have you who are now, you know, grown up. So I wasn't terrified of dying. So I thought I, I did speak to somebody at the Royal Marsden where I'm treated and said, look, what will happen if I stop the treatment? And they took me through the process and they said, we need to know if you're going down that route because we would need to manage it uh, with the proper drugs so that you're not in too much pain. So I thought about it and I, and I had a therapist and I've had him for a long time uh, called Bruce. And um, I trust him implicitly. He saved my life many, many times. And he said, look, I'm not going to persuade you one way or the other, but he said to me, why don't you just give it the cricket season? and take the treatment on offer and give it the cricket season at the end. But we were both cricket fans. Um, and uh, and I just thought, do you know, that's an idea. I could go and watch cricket this summer. And that was really what made me postpone, you know, take the treatment on offer and and just go and watch some cricket for the summer. And that's what, that's what I did, basically. 
Yeah, no, I, c- I can certainly imagine being in that much pain. That was that was why that was an option that that you considered. But you know, thankfully, thankfully you didn't. And that is the next thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, was the cricket aspect of the story. And being a massive cricket fan myself, I have to say I was instantly really interested when I saw when I saw the title of the book and I thought. I wonder what role cricket can play in helping someone through the grieving process. But actually, instantly I had a good idea because, you know, the type of games that you went to go and see, I mean, for anyone not listening uh, in the UK, these games can last four days and there's quite a slow, quite a slow pace to them and um, not, not really full crowds. So it's somewhere where you can, you can go and have something going on, but also sort of not be overwhelmed by your surroundings. So I really understood sort of how it might be able to help you um and i was also very jealous that you got to watch an entire season of uh of, of count of county cricket but i'm just wondering in yeah how how you saw it um how you envisaged it helping you um and whether in the end it it did provide some some comfort yeah um not at first i mean my first game i decided that i wanted to go to places that had a resonance for vicky and i um and i started at sussex um hove on opening day they were playing leicestershire and the reason i went there was a i used to keep a flat in hove um where i if i had a book to finish i'd go and write it there and vicky and i had lovely times in brighton and meals and so on and um also playing leicestershire where she'd gone to university so that was a big part of her life and I thought this was all going to be lovely and and what have you and i booked myself into the holiday inn for four days and I was just edgy and, and panicky. Um, the first day I'm, I had lunch with a good old friend of mine, Paul Hayward, who was the Daily Telegraph's chief sports writer for a long time. He lives in Brighton. And, um, and that was lovely. But then he went off to work and, and I, I got very edgy. And then the second night, uh, I just wanted to be back home back in the house where Vicky kind of Vicky's presence was really. I mean, all her photos and everything. I'd taken photos of her with me for the room, the hotel room, but it just wasn't the same. And on the Saturday night after going to the cricket, <laughs> I didn't, I don't know why I didn't think of this, but the hotel was just full of hen and stag do's. Yeah. I remember reading yeah. it. Yeah, And yeah. I thought I am so in the wrong place. I mean, there's an expression about intruding on private grief. I was intruding on private merriment and I just didn't feel, and I thought, I, I checked out the hotel and I said, look, I'll obviously pay. And what they said, you don't need to pay for some of the other two nights, just pay for tonight, which I did. And, um, and I got home and I was relieved to get home. And I thought, I'm not going to be able to do this this summer, you know, be able to go and watch county cricket. But I mean, gradually it eased and, and, I had, I could never really do more than two and a half days anywhere though, more than two nights away. You know, I went to Scarborough, which was just so lovely. Vicky and I had been to Scarborough. It's where she went for all her childhood holidays and she took great pleasure in sort of showing me around the town and everything and um, and her memories as a little kid. Uh, and she always said, we'll go to Scarborough and watch Yorkshire play one year. And we never got round to it. Um, so I, I was glad I went to Scarborough. I saw them play Surrey. It was a great game, really nice. And and um, and again, I I mean, I got edgy, but I, you know, I knew I had to just keep going to these things. And the games I liked were the games like at Leicestershire, you know, at Grace Road. There weren't more than a hundred people in the ground, um, and the game meandered. You could you could have company if you wanted it. You could go and find cups of tea and cake and all the rest of it. You could sit on your own if you wanted. And the rhythms of the game and the and the nuances of the game, that you could be in and out of grief. And cricket is in and out of exciting passages and, and, and fallow periods as well. And just the whole mood and the whole rhythm of it kind of suited where I was, really. 
yeah, I remember read as a reader, I certainly felt this way, and I wonder if other people did. But it's almost like um, we, you know, we were rooting for you each time <laughs> to be able to stick it out um, more days, yeah, you know. Yeah. And obviously, as the book goes on, um, you do it. I certainly felt like that when I was reading. I was like, "Come on, you can do, you can oh, do well, this." That's you know? interesting. That's a no, nice reaction. So. No, on it, honestly, it was. Uh, I felt that very strongly. You know, I was reading it, and, and you are you are rooting for you in 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 the book, certainly in in, in that way. But but yeah, as I was saying, I can certainly understand sort of. The, the benefits um, of cricket in in that situation, and um, and Ian, one thing that I, I wanted to touch on, which you have touched on already, is the um, and it's something that I talk about on this podcast a lot, given the the mental health link, and that is um, how useful you found therapy to be. And I must admit, after reading the book, I wanted to call your therapist myself because he <laughs> seemed so fantastic. I thought I could do with the, I could do with this guy in my life as well. But I wondered if you could um, tell us a bit about yeah, just how how much of an impact therapy has had on your life in general, and also how it's helped you through the the grieving process. Well. I mean, it most certainly has. And um, I don't know much better than talking therapy, to be honest. Uh, I I was an alcoholic in my late 20s. I crossed the line in my late 20s. And for five years, I drank very heavily on a daily basis. And when my daughter was born, I decided I couldn't go on like this. So I um, I went into a treatment centre. And I was in a treatment center for almost 12 weeks. Nowadays, they give you 28 days, basically, because that's all insurers will pay for. But in those days, this was the late 80s, 1980s. Um, you were discharged when they thought you were ready for discharge. So I, I spent nearly three months there. And that set me on my path of learning how to... Um, and this sounds odd, given that I didn't do it when Vicky was dying. Um, ask for help. I learned how to ha- ask for help. I learned um, to trust other people uh, more. And I, I mean, I've been going to Alcoholics Anonymous for 33 years now. So um, I kind of have met so many people. And there did come a time, you know, like maybe, yeah, it was about four years, five years into recovery of being sober that I just was struggling with it. Even going to AO, I was just struggling with this whole, you know, things were hitting me, things weren't going right in my life um, for whatever reason. And I was recommended by an old friend that I had been in treatment with, uh, go and see this guy. And his name was Bruce. And um, I went to see him. And that was in 1993. And I've been seeing him ever since. So that's 28 years. We've had little breaks here and there. But, I mean, he's now in his 70s, and he's very much under the radar. He's he's treated a lot of very, very well-known people, uh, household names, but is very much, you know, n- not a celebrity therapist by any means. A very humble man, a man I would trust my life with. And, in fact, he's... So I saw him all the way through my grieving and uh nor he he has a little he had a little therapy room he doesn't have it anymore in north london and uh in the corner there's a couch and i've never sat on a couch in therapy in my life but there were some times during my grieving when i was in sessions with him and i was so distraught and so in pain that I couldn't even sit. I had to lie down. Mm. I was so exhausted as well through not sleeping. Yeah. Um, So I would absolutely urge talking therapy. And it's the only way that it's kind of, you know, I didn't want to take medication. Um, Obviously, there were friends, I think, people who didn't know me through um, my program of recovery the 12 steps of AA. Most of the people that I knew through that that fellowship would, would say, we thought you'd be okay. But people in the village, I think, thought I might drink again because they don't know that my sob- sobriety was pretty solid. They thought I might drink again. I That was never an option for me. Wow. Never an option for me. Wow. I'm going to be honest here. Taking my life was more of an option. Um, that would... 
so that the pain the thing is uh, i talk about it in the book and I, this is i didn't expect um you know you go through this phase of and everybody has it um i wish i'd done more i wish i'd said more if i only i'd done this and it's called magical thinking and there's a great book by joan didion about losing her husband called the year of magical thinking it's called magical thinking that you know you're almost playing God. If only I'd done this, they'd still be alive today. And it's just, you know, you beat yourself up with these kind of things. And I wish I'd said that, or I wish I'd done more of this. I wish I'd sat with her on the couch watching movies more, or I wish I'd gone to Bhutan with her, you know. And you can't, you do think like that, but ultimately, obviously, it's very counterproductive and painful. So I, I got... Uh, after she died, Vicky was my second wife and I didn't meet her till I was in my 40s and she was in the third, and she had a life before me. And I got very angry. I found in her office, I'd never been into her filing cabinets before and I found all pictures from previous relationships and diaries and what have you from years back. And, and I was angry with all these people that had had time with Vicky that I wanted, you know, knew her when she was in her 20s and had had relationships with her and and I became very jealous of those people. Um, and I became obsessive. Now, with my therapist, I traced it back to some trauma in my adolescence. Um, and that made sense. You know, we get echo, we're an echo chamber of things that happened to us. And any trauma we may have suffered, grief is such, uh, so insidious. Any little armor you've built up, it finds its way in. And there's a diagram in the book of, of where, you know, for a Venn diagram, you've got two circles of grief and trauma. And where the two intersect, you've then got this panic. That's what happened to me, this panic, and it's never going away. And that's why people with trauma that get triggered, it's not widely enough known. People in that situation, the agitation, the panic, the sheer terror at times of what you're going through and this blackness that it's never going to end, you would rather take your own life than be re-traumatized. That's how powerful it is. And there are people that do take their own life. I mean, this is where, to address your question, Sam, this is where my program um, of, you know, one day at a time, this too will pass. If I just don't drink alcohol today, things will get better. Doing the simple things, that's where my program and all my support network of people, um, you know, a very good friend of mine um, is Tony Adams, the old Arsenal and England captain, and, and I wrote his book, two books with him. And Tony was always phoning me up and saying, you know, look, talk to me, tell me. And, and I had... 10 people like that, that were doing that for me. So that was hard won though. You know, all my net support network was hard won. You know, my therapist, I needed every day of sobriety of 33 years, every, every friend that knew about this stuff, I, I knew and needed to use them all just to get through it. Yeah, I remember reading in the book. I think it, does it say where grief meets trauma? There's insanity. Is that yeah, is that that's yeah? Is how I felt exactly. No, and it's really powerfully conveyed in the book. But also, you know, during that um, obsessive period that you had of of wanting to find out more about the past and all the rest of it, I got the impression in the book that you almost felt like you you were crazy to be to be doing that and and all the rest of it. But but actually, as a reader, I didn't feel that at all. Oh, I could actually interesting. Yeah, I could actually really understand why someone might do that because the one person that could give you a direct, easy answer in the moment is not there. And so it could very easily become, you can get anxious about that and then you could become obsessive about sort of delving into the past. So I actually didn't find that crazy at all as a okay. reader. Yeah, I could really, I could well, really relate to that. I can tell you it felt crazy um, because, you know, everybody I ever met said to me, Vicky was absolutely doted on you. She loved you. You were the love of her life, every other relationship she had. And she once said to me, she said, if I'd known I was going to meet you, I'd have never had another previous relationship. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And I was, people's trauma is different. 
people's obsessions are different and they're particular to them, depending on their life experiences, their family of origin, what happened to them. Um, some people may say your jealousy, your obsession, I don't understand it. I don't get it. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Equally, they may have their own set of traumas and circumstances that are particular to them that cause them an extreme reaction that wouldn't do it for me because, you know, we're all different. So I, it's interesting, and I thank you for, for saying that, but it did feel crazy. And, and, and a lot of people, some people that I would try and talk to about it said, well, I don't understand it. I mean, just, you know, you've got to move on from this or whatever. Or And that uh, so much easier said than done. There just came a time where I got so tired of, you know, as we say in AA, so tired of feeling, you know, sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. But I kind of, um, in the end, let go. And somebody, you know, said some things to me about Vicky and what the, Vicky had confided into them that really, that really turned me around and, um, and, and sort of, you know, I've heard this expression about the balance of mind, people's minds being, it's an old fashioned expression being disturbed, but that's how mine felt. All my equilibrium had gone. And, you know, looking back, uh, it can resurface, you know, Sam, it can resurface. But but looking back, um, it was probably the most um, nuts part of my life. I just finished reading the Reverend Richard Coles's book, The, the Mad Madness of Grief. And he had it as well in that, which surprised me. After his partner, David, died, uh, he couldn't face all the, the sort of paperwork around the house and things that needed to be doing. So a friend came and, and went into David's office and various nooks and crannies of the house and tried to sort things out. And he said, I was terrified that they were going to find something that I didn't know about. You yeah, know? very similar to you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That I'd, mm. you know, I'd heard about people that were living a double life. They had another family in a different part of the country or whatever. And that's how irrational you get, you know? I can imagine. I think I think actually sort of being a sufferer of, uh, of anxiety myself that actually helped me to sort of understand slightly how your brain was was working in that situation, because often it's about you need you need an answer immediately to calm down your way of thinking. And I thought, God, if you can't get that, I can imagine how that would really spiral out of control. So as I said, for me, it certainly didn't seem nuts at all. I actually had a had a real under understanding of it to, to some extent anyway. But so obviously that was um it was a key turning point for you, Ian, understanding sort of where where the anxiety, where the obsession uh, was coming from through, you know, talking to, to your therapist and having the support from people. But there's another thing that I wanted to touch on, and this is the idea of, of waves of grief, which you also mention in the book. And there's one particular moment where I think you're watching Leicester Gloucester. I think it was. I think it might have been. Yeah. And you know, and the waves of grief, by that I think you mean, you know, you're feeling sort of generally better on the whole and then all of a sudden it just sort of unexpectedly hits you. And I'm just wondering sort of if you could tell us about that and, and also if you developed any ways of, of sort of coping with that, because I imagine that's quite a common feeling that people uh, going through the grieving process, I imagine it's quite quite a common thing that people feel. Yes. And the thing is, because I was fortunate in one sense in that that I had therapy and I had a, a program of recovery, um, I could tap into things. There are times when you're just so overwhelmed by it all that all you can do really is, is just hang on, is just not do something silly. And But what things I've learned down the years is that panic attacks, people think panic attacks last for hours. They last for about 30 seconds to a minute but it feels like forever and if you especially if they keep coming back but the body just can't cope with more than that amount of time so if you kind of tell yourself that i i mean i was fortunate through therapy to discover that my trauma and why i was getting panicky about vicky um and my my loss was 
there had been times in my life when I was worried I was, you know, going to lose Vicky. Now I had lost her. So all those times when I'd been panicky in the past, I, I now had literally physically lost her, that it was just all building up. So my coping mechanisms were getting to understand what was going on and saying, ah, I see. OK, um, so I am having panic attacks. They don't last forever. This too shall pass. Um, I am rendered immobile by this at the moment, um, but it won't always be this way. You know, so many people kind of think, well, if I feel like this, I'm going to feel this way forever. Uh, it, you know, if I feel bad, I'm going to feel bad forever. If I feel good, it's going to end at six o'clock tonight. So that kind of went on. But I got to the root of what my trauma was. And once you do that, it has less power over you. You know, what is driving this anxiety? And when you know that, you can almost have a conversation with it and almost kind of, you don't want to feel it, but almost get it over with, you know? Yeah, absolutely. To be able to understand it and and try and rationalize it is um yeah is a really powerful thing. And I love that uh, quote. This too shall pass. It's uh, it's actually one of my my personal favorites um, that I tell myself on a on a regular basis when I'm when I'm not feeling great. So I can certainly understand that. And um, so at this point, Ian, you're starting to understand things more. And uh, I certainly got the impression in the book that you were starting to to feel a, a bit better. But another interesting thing that you mentioned is when you when you reach this stage, you are then hit with the with the guilt initially of, you know, I shouldn't be feeling better. You know, I should be, uh, am I forgetting uh, Vicky or something like that? But then you actually come to realise that's not it at all. Now I am just more able to be thankful and focus on the good times that um, that I had. And I, I think one phrase is, you know, that you were lucky to have loved so so deeply. And, um, and, and I just thought that's a really powerful sentiment. And I wondered if you could just sort of explain a bit about that guilt transitioning into, into actually realising that's, that's not what it was. Well, first off, the greater the love, the deeper the grief. I mean, and so many people have said it better than I have in the past that... that um, you know, grief is the price we pay for love. So um, I kind of, once the madness had subsided, and where am I? I'm two years and four months since Vicky died. So I would say it, that happened um, about nine months ago, where, you know, about 18 months. The The sort of, nuttiness kind of as i call it nuttiness it's not nuttiness it's just a phase of grief um people should not beat themselves up about being crazy or mad or whatever it's just you're just grieving and you're just in pain and and it's it's overwhelming um but that kind of finally went and i began to think about you know what i might do with the rest of my life and such as it was because you know, I do have a secondary and it's not going to be uh, a lot of years, but I want to make the most of the years I have. I enrolled on a course at Cambridge to do a master's and I've been writing um, and I didn't want to waste my time. Obviously, lockdown was such a, for those who grieve, lockdown was very hard. But I'm fortunate more than the most in that that I can, um, I like reading, I like writing. Uh, I'm okay in my own company by and large. Uh, so that, that was all right, but it was, it, it stopped you doing obviously. Um, and I'm no different from anyone else, but just at a time when you thought, you know, I'm ready to sort of do a few things now, you know, I wanted to go back to a place in Italy where Vicky and I had lovely holidays and I booked a hotel and that the hotel and that all went by the wayside, obviously. Um, I wanted to take my son on a road trip to California for his birthday, and well, that never happened. Um, so I, I did. There was a feeling of feeling better, if that's the right way of putting it, or certainly feeling less anxious and thinking, I don't want to betray Vicky though by by sort of not grieving her, not mourning her. You know, um, she deserves me for the rest of my life to mourn her. And funnily enough. 
I had lunch today with three friends, great friends of Vicky, who we organised a dinner at Lord's Cricket Ground um, about nine months after. They they helped to organise it, and we made £100,000 for the Royal Marsden. It was an amazing night. And these three friends I was with today, and they're all going, you know, come on, Ian, it's time to get out there now. It's time to meet someone else and all that. And, uh, and I'm thinking... Wow, that all seems a bit overwhelming, but you that's know, too much. What they're yeah. trying trying to tell me is you've mm. got to try and put yourself first now and do do stuff and and I, you know I will and I'm I'm happy. I I don't feel as guilty um, as I did about feeling better about maybe I'm betraying Vicky's memory by enjoying myself. You know, I had that feeling that at Scarborough, the cricket. And I, I actually remember thinking, oh, this is nice. I'm enjoying this. Immediately. I thought that I thought that is just pure selfish. Vicky has just died. Your wife has died and you, she's not here to enjoy this and you're enjoying yourself. You don't deserve to. So it was kind of that feeling is gone, thankfully. Um, and I'm now kind of doing a few things that, that, will hopefully give me some pleasure. Yeah, well, it's fantastic to to hear that that you've reached that that point, Ian. And um, one thing that I wanted to uh, touch on just before my my last question is, um, you, you mentioned there about about your own secondary cancer, Ian, and and in the book you detail the moment where you're effectively uh, told that perhaps there might be sort of five years left or, or or something like that. And I'm and I'm wondering what if first of all if anything has changed since uh, since obviously that that was written in the book, and and if not, sort of how one goes about being confronted with you know with with a finite amount of 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 time left as i say vicky never wanted to know what her prognosis was i'm different because i i want to in the time honored phrase get my affairs in order um i wanted to work out if i've got enough money to live on as well in all honesty yeah, yeah. whether it might run out yeah but um so i asked and they said somewhere between three and seven years. So I'm going to hope for seven. That was two years ago. Um, I'm currently uh, on a drug that has been working well for me. There's just been a blip in my results recently, so I've got to go back for another scan in a week or so. It, it is a bit of a shock, but, you know, when you've tried to tell yourself for so long to live one day at a time, then... Um, you kind of realize you have to tell yourself, well, I'm not going to die today, just not today. I might do, actually. You know, we, we all might, but it's not likely today. So that's all I can tell myself. And and gradually get my head around the fact that my time is limited and that I, um, I've had a – I want while I'm still physically able – want to to sort of just achieve a few things, not travel to the other side of the world like Vicky did, but um, just achieve a few things, personal goals and so on. Um, and also, you know, I'm okay, Sam, really. Uh, like I said at the beginning, I, I've had a good life and I've been fortunate and I was loved and I, and I, I did love. So, you know, and I feel I've left things behind. I will leave things behind. You know, it's a couple of books I'm very proud of um, that will help people. So, you know, um, it's getting your head around it, really. Yeah, I can imagine. And thank you for for yeah answering that question so honestly, because I imagine you know it is it is a difficult question. But my thinking was that you know I could learn a lot from that sort of the how you might approach that situation and that way of thinking you know i thought i could learn a lot from that it, and um it's it, it all comes down in the end to acceptance and self acceptance you know listen if i'm being entirely honest with you at the end i expect like everybody else that gets there i will be terrified but there was a peace to vicky in her last week there was a acceptance and there was a peace to her at the very last uh, there were moments when she was very frightened, but there was a peace to her and an acceptance. And I think that's the most we can all hope for, that there there will be anxiety and fear at the end, even a terror, I'm afraid. And I, I, I don't know, but I hope also to have that acceptance that Vicky showed. 
Yeah, well, I, I imagine having thought that all through and, and mentally preparing yourself for it helps in some way. But the the acceptance part is um is certainly interesting. And and yeah, Ian, overall, I just um I admire your bravery on on so many levels. Really, I admire your bravery in in writing the book, which you know I, I want to add again is is a, is a brilliant read and one that people can 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 learn a lot from. And and also, you know being so honest in it including all of the aspects of the story not just the rosy ones for example about um your, yours and Vicky's relationship and detailing your own period where you know uh, where you became obsessive and stuff like that I just thought that some people may have left these parts out of the story and you chose to to make it yeah. totally unfiltered well and- she said she said to me before she died I want you to do my eulogy and I want you to be honest about me and about us and I said you know I love you madly Vicky um and uh um i will be honest about about that and um you know but when two people are so passionate there is a volatility to the relationship sometimes but we always came back to each other <laughs> you know emotionally we always came back to each other yeah yeah no i can understand that and um and yeah and also Ian, i i admire your bravery so much for um for being able to you know come on the, the, this podcast and and, and talk My about pleasure. it Thank I, I, Thank I really appreciate that and i hope it um you know it can go some way perhaps towards helping uh, anyone who might be listening who's perhaps going through their their own uh, journey of grief but just as a as a way of finishing off ian and i'm, I'm conscious that i've taken much probably much more at this stage uh, than the promised hour of your time so, so sorry about that but i wondered if before leaving Ian, you had um, any sort of parting bits of advice uh, for listeners that might be going through their own really tough time. Um, and I'll leave that up to you, whether you want to relate that specifically to grief or just sort of uh, adversity uh, more generally. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Well, my um, my general advice is um, talk to people. There are days when you don't want to talk. There are days when you can't get out of the house, but, you know, force yourself to do one thing a day, whether that's a walk, whether that's to pick up, just pick up the phone and um, give yourself uh, permission to feel a bit crazy. Give yourself um, credit when you even put on a pair of socks in the morning. Um, Take it just for today um just because this is how it is today doesn't mean this is how it will be tomorrow um I, a lovely piece in in um reverend richard coles's book which i also said a friend of mine said to me also um during this he said ian you get a free pass now for a while he said when you've lost your loved one people will be so nice to you for the next year minimum make the most of it so i'd pass on that advice to people wow that's interesting make the most of people being nice to you (laughs) yes absolutely um and um yeah uh, and find something find something that will give you solace give you help in my case it was cricket uh whatever that may be somebody told me about how they loved um knitting how how they did a lot of knitting after the they lost their loved one um whatever it is find it absolutely yeah i think that's a powerful point yeah find find your cricket and yeah. the other thing that that was pointed out to me uh and i didn't realize i'd done this by going to all the places that vicky and i had been to to watch cricket um i was on a pilgrimage of sorts you going go you know going back to places that had meant so much and you know, I would say to people, honour those things about your loved one. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I can imagine that must have actually been, you know, really difficult. And you have to be brave to go back to those places, yeah, which cause emotions to come people up. Are different. Some people don't want to go back. And uh, I kind of get that. You know, you go one or two ways. You know, you know, you either move house and leave the past behind or you entrench yourself in the memory of that. And that's what I've done. That may not work for other people. But it's what works for you and find out what works for you. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's incredibly individual, incredibly personal. But I certainly think that a lot of the pieces of advice uh, that you gave there, Ian, could help people in, in many different situations. And certainly a lot of them resonated with me. So yeah, finally, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on. It's been an absolute privilege to to talk to you. And uh, yeah, it's a chat that I've learned so much from and also one that I, I hope can, can help some people listening as well. So thank you very much, Ian. Well, thank you, Sam. Um, and thank you for asking me. That's it for today's episode, guys. I hope you liked it or found it useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe. It really helps the channel out. And also that way it makes sure that you never miss an episode. If you've got a story you want to share on the Back on Track podcast, get in touch. I'd love to hear from you via backontrackpod at gmail.com.